Dana Denha here, and this is Let's Watch with the Ann Arbor Film Festival. Every year, talented filmmakers from all over the world aim to take part in our local film fest. Sometimes the talent isn't far from home, as locals make their mark on this internationally renowned annual event. In this series, we're going to sit down with new filmmakers each month to take a look at their film and learn more about the festival. Joining me is Heidi Kumo, here with her film, Swallowed Whole. I'm sorry, did I say your last name pr properly? Can no. you correct me on that? <laughs> Kumau. 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 Yeah. Sorry about that. So why don't you tell me, first of all, uh, what your involvement has been with the Ann Arbor Film Festival? Um, I've been involved with it almost pretty much since I moved to Ann Arbor. Um, I was asked to be on the, uh, um, the board of directors, I don't know, maybe... Uh, 2002 or three. Okay, so it's been um, quite a few years now. Yeah, yeah, I'm not on the board right anymore, mm -hmm. but um, and that was by the director at that point, who is Christina Hamilton. Um, and then um, we had a number of changes with the directors um, over the years, and I was sort of on the board as we went through changes for the festival ch and changes, you know. Um, changes in direct the director changes in kind of the mission and the overall I mean that the 2000s were a, the hugest change in film technology since you oh know, yeah. Edison pretty much yeah. so um, the film festival had to adapt to um, a, 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 a accepting uh, digital formats where it had previously been a solely 16 millimeter film festival which wasn't um, sustainable or really logical um, at well, certain I don't, point. It's, a, it's always at the Michigan Theater, <coughs> and mm -hmm. I don't think Michigan Theater, I think they just use like thumb drives now, right? To uh, play their they have an iMac. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, with Christina, at, at the first person to kind of transition us from 16 millimeter um, to accepting video. And then gradually over the years, we've had um, Tom Bray as a local. Um, works at the university in IT and uh, due to that, he has helped us immensely and he's the one that digitizes the entire film festival wow. basically and gets it on um, one drive basically, yeah. <laughs> um, which is a Herculean task. Um, but so it's grown like um, I've also, so I've been on the board, I've also been on different um, parts of the screening process. So we have the festival, at least when I was involved, has like a two or three tier screening process. And the first um, screening is kind of just determining whether the films are appropriate for the festival. It's a very um, unique festival in that it focuses almost purely on experimental work. Mm -hmm. And so, um, unlike most festivals where there are mostly, generally speaking, most festivals focus on um, either like kind of dramatic things with scripts and actors, just clearly not what I do, um, and then maybe have one program of animation and one program of experimental, and then the rest is kind of more like what you see in regular theaters, like Hollywood kind of type drama type things or documentary festivals or another popular thing. Or, you know, there's festivals that specialize in animation, documentary, mm -hmm. uh, drama, that kind of thing. Um, but the Ann Arbor Film Festival, one thing that I'm very proud of it for sticking with, even when, you know, <coughs> Sundance and all these big kind of indie film festivals were kind of taking over and sort of changing the, the sort of look and feel of a lot of festivals, Ann Arbor has stayed true to its roots, which is to be an art film festival, you know, experimental, um, not your standard things you see ever. You might not see any of those things in a, you know, ever again, or, you know, not certainly not easily in the United States. Oh, yeah, it's very <coughs> unique. I was or even in this area. <laughs> I was curious, do you get a lot of people that send just like narratives, like regular? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so people, so just my experience this year in um, entering a film into a lot of film festivals. Um, there are services for entering your films and um, uh, you have to pay a fee. So, I mean, it's a sort of calculated gamble that you take. And a lot of people just, I don't know, they've got a lot of money and they just sort of like blindly send their film to a lot of festivals without really checking like what does that festival show. 
So that first screening process I was talking about, that sort of weeds out most of that kind of work. Mm -hmm. It's just not what th this festival shows. Um, and then the second weeding is once you've gotten down to, okay, now we know it's probably, it could play in our festival, um, then it's more selective in terms of programming and choices made by the program director, mm -hmm. um, David Janelle. Um, and um, the, there's sometimes other people that help program How many well. categories <coughs> are there in the festival? Well, I don't know if there's categories so much. I mean, there's, OK, that's not, maybe not true. There's, um, uh, you, I guess, experimental, animation, documentary. Um, those are the three main ones mm -hmm. that I've seen the most of. Occasionally, there's um, something scripted, but it's pretty rare. And I would say also the film ten the film festival tends to show shorts. I was going to say, are they anything. typically short format? Yeah, yeah. So a typical screening where you buy a ticket and you go sit down will have you know eight to ten films of all different types. It's maybe the closest I can think in terms of programming would be to like freeform radio, mm -hmm. which like WCBN or something, or WFMU, um, where uh, there's, there's I, th I would say that they're sculpted together to maybe be thematically or mood-wise or aesthetically related. Um, and uh, I would say, and so there are some special programmings that uh, programs that are curated in addition to the submissions that come in from um, the web and on the, off the street. Mm -hmm. right? um, in general, the festival, at last time I checked, they were getting uh, like 3,400 entries, submissions. Yeah. Which is a hell of a lot of things to yeah. go through. I'm sure they're getting even more now. Um, and in the end, I think they only show, you know, 100, 120. So it's not films. easy. It's not easy no, to get your film in the really festival. really hard. So I was super uh, glad to be in it. I mean, I even though I'm familiar with them, I have no part in selecting the films and, and, and as, as I'm no longer a board member. Um, so um, I was just excited. Because I know I have a lot of friends that are filmmakers, and they're always really super bummed when they don't get into the Ann Arbor Film Festival. Because for the art film and experimental film you know, uh, world, Ann Arbor is seen as really like the top um, place to show your oh, film. Oh, yeah, definitely. <clears throat> I mean, there's Sundance for like dramatic stuff and maybe documentaries. And I would say you know, there's only a few festivals that really specialize in um, curate experimental work yeah I mean so. when I've uh, what I've seen is like I've never seen anything like it and it's like totally the films you see are totally unexpected you don't yeah. know what to think going into right. it because you'd never expect to see what I mean it's like going into the mind of a dream <laughs> yeah yeah I would say and you know I mean even as a filmmaker I don't always love every single film right I mean often some of the films they don't. They might not have a narrative. It may not be about um, uh, sort of a time journey that we're used to taking when we watch a film. It may be just like a concert. It might be. be I often try to tell my students like some of these films are going to be an experience, like for your eyes, for your ears, for that kind of uh, um, you know visual oral. Tr the filmmaker's trying to provide you with an experience. It's yes. not really about beginning, middle, end kind of um, kind of clean. Yeah, you can't clean. always follow the story. There's yeah. not always a story to yeah, follow. Yeah, there's not always a story. So um, <laughs> that always takes some people by surprise, I think. And so I, I always just tell my students, you know, there's 10 films. Sometimes um, I get up in the middle of one because I'm not always in love with yeah. every single film. But I do try to watch as many as I can. I go to as many screenings as I can. Because there's there are things there that you will never see. It'll be really hard to see any other way unless you're at the film festival. Now we've heard about Heidi's experience with the Ann Arbor Film Festival. Let's watch her film, Swallowed Whole.
Well, thanks for sharing your film from the 2014 festival. 2015. 20, oh, yeah. yeah, because it'll be 2016 <laughs> next year. Okay. Duh. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about your idea for the film? Because this is new for you. From what you were telling me before we started, uh -huh. that filmmaking in this natural form like this is not your typical. Right. I mean, I um, the film itself is was a uh, the idea came from um, a personal experience where I uh, broke my back in a sledding accident. So um, all those references to ice and snow are based on a kind of reality. Uh -huh. um, and the, I think the two things that um, guided me in the creation of the film were, one, um, the fact that I had to lay on my couch for three, four months. Um, when, when you break your back, they give you this uh, custom-made shell, and basically the only two things you can do are lay down or stand up, and you can't sit like this as mm -hmm. we are here. Um, and so I spent a lot of time laying down, staring at the ceiling. Um, when you're in the hospital being wheeled around, also I was looking at the ceiling. So um, this idea of that perspective, the sort of looking up from below, became the perspective that I thought I wanted to make the film from. Um, and so that's why some of the shots are definitely from below looking yeah. up. Um, and then the second uh, thing that guided me in sort of making like the editing of it was <clears throat> thinking about the form of a movie and how to make the form, the like how can I edit it or how can I make the visuals I don't go with this idea of how I broke my back. And mm -hmm. I, I, I broke my back by going up in the air and then coming, slamming down. So the slamming in the film is meant to kind of echo that process of how I broke my back, literally. Um, and it's also an echo of a pretty famous uh, video piece by an artist named Joan Jonas, who did a piece in the 70s called Vertical Roll, which referenced old school analog TV problems with your TV, where it does this vertical roll thing, oh, and yeah. the picture's unstable, and kind of does this yeah. thing. Um, and she had a piece about kind of woman's identity, and the camera sort of is, is looking at her as she's reciting some stuff, but her, her image keeps slipping mm -hmm. out of the frame. And um, it's, it's really hard to watch. It's also really loud. and. Um, just that, dis that visual disturbance. I wanted to create something visual in the film that felt physical. Um, and so the lying on my back and then the, the phys wanting to create a physical experience. Because I come more from the art world and I make sort of sculptural work that has a physical component, when I decided, OK, this is not going to be an installation right now, like I thought, oh, I'm going to project on ceiling and all this other stuff. I'm just going to make a movie. Then I started asking myself, well, what can I do with that form to make it, I don't know, to create, uh, increase its impact. Mm -hmm. And so um, once I started making things, I sort of like made an animation stand where I could shoot um, uh, and then reverse some images that so that I would create this sort of sense of an x-ray. So there's some I black and white. I was wondering if you just created that all digitally <coughs> or if you were like making it in real um, life. I made it in real life and then I um, inverted it. Mm -hmm. So um, there's like melting ice, bur ice cubes that look like a spine. Um, there's a number of things that all reference um, a spine, <laughs> basically. Um, and then as I was making it, uh, 
and the whole, the whole image of a um, being underneath a frozen lake, sort of, yeah. that was sort of what was sort of um, in my head while I was recovering from this injury. And I thought, oh, I found out about this residency in the Arctic where you go to the Arctic on a boat with other artists and you film and photograph and record whatever. Um, and I thought, oh, I really do need to go under ice with a camera and film it. And so I got this opportunity to go uh, in 2013 to the Arctic. And so the f some of the footage, like the, actually the final shots where I'm on an iceberg, um, those are not photoshopped. I was really on an iceberg wow. in the Arctic. <laughs> you really went all out for yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, that just sort of happened during the trip. It wasn't, I didn't necessarily plan that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the shots of kind of going underwater and then coming back up and the different, um, there's some, I have, lots of beautiful shots of ice, and there's lots of different kinds of ice I learned. Um, but all of that kind of ended up feeding into the film. So did you actually go under the ice for those shots? Well, or? what I did was um, I researched before I went on the trip, like I don't have a waterproof camera, and actual, like if you're gonna be an oceanographer and you go buy a camera, they're several thousand dollars. And I thought, I'm not gonna really be using it except for this trip. Yeah. So what can I find that's cheaper and can go underwater? And GoPros are amazing, um, pretty cheap and great H, you know, full high definition film and photos. So I just took a GoPro and brought a very long kind of monopod. And we would go around these icebergs kind of bumpily <laughs> and I'd stick the GoPro under or as close to the ice as I could. Uh -huh. We, you know, I tried millions of different, some ice that was this thick and some icebergs that were, you know, I don't know, a hundred years old. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I ended up using a very common camera, but it worked great. Um, so what, yeah. it, for you, what part of the film sticks out the most for you? Because it's obviously a very <coughs> personal story, and watching yours, yours definitely had a story. I could see the story. I mean, yeah. I didn't know that you broke your back and that was the story behind right. it, but it definitely has a story to tell. Um, I think the part I'm the happiest with is just that kind of um, the slamming, you know, m managing that just sort of in post-production mm -hmm. and kind of um, adding the sound um, and getting the motion to f literally feel like a drop, like the film is kind of slipping out of itself. Yeah. Um, that kind of disorientation. Um, and then that, the last two shots where I'm in a <laughs> University of Michigan hospital gown, <laughs> um, I, uh, that was actually not planned. I had brought the, the um, robe with me in my suitcase and then we found this um, huge <laughs> uh, iceberg, the captain of the ship, and he knew that a lot of us liked icebergs. So he pushed this huge thing from the rough water into a fjord, which is like where it's calmer. And we took turns basically going onto this iceberg and just doing like spontaneous performances. And um, so a couple of people were ahead of me doing things with different costumes and I had brought a baby outfit. That didn't, it just totally flopped, it was silly. And then I'm like, okay, last second. I'm just gonna put this robe off, take off my clothes and you know, it was like this very last minute thing and I, handed, I had handed all my cameras to a, another photographer on the trip. And um, I tried to duplicate how I had felt so kind of isolated and I had other medical things later that year that um, in the cancer ward. So I had a, a couple years of just crazy hospital experiences. And so I put myself on that iceberg and then sort of put myself in these, I don't know, very simple poses where I was being in my mind kind of x-rayed. Mm -hmm. And um, so I laid down and I stood up, like just the different ways they would x-ray me or radiate me. And um, it ended up becoming a, a really powerful metaphor for a lot of things. I mean, when I got back on the boat, the, the main boat <coughs> off of the iceberg, everybody said, we thought you were making a big statement about American health care. <laughs> you know, that <laughs> I'm this isolated, left alone <laughs> patient, you know. Um, and I said, well, I, I wasn't intending that, but that's a great way to read the image. <laughs> yeah, but you were isolated. I mean, I yeah. can't imagine what it would be like to well, be. you can't drive when yeah. you're in that back brace thing. I mean, I'm lucky that, you know, 
I don't have serious uh, permanent damage yeah. from a broken bone in my back, but um, it was <laughs> definitely not a fun experience to be pretty much completely like removed from your life and yeah. sort of sitting on your couch. So while you know, as an artist and you're laying on your couch, you come up with all kinds of crazy ideas, and that was kind of where that film started. Was did you think <coughs> um, but prior to this whole backbreaking incident, yeah. were you ever planning on making a film and submitting it to the Ann Arbor Film Festival? Well, or I think was the story kind of what motivated you to do it? Yeah, I mean, I've I've made lots of films that are short, um, but usually um, are projected and mm -hmm. are projected on objects. So they're short stories about um, the ones that I've been working on lately are about sort of surviving confinement of different types. So they weren't stories about me. They were about um, uh, ones based on the book Reading Lolita in Tehran. So it's about using books to survive a kind of very repressive government, especially for the women. Um, I did another piece about <coughs> based on the book um, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, where um, a man uh, has uh, locked in syndrome. Uh, it was a mo made by into a movie by Julian Schnabel. Um, and about how he survived, he wrote his memoir. The only thing he could do was blink one eye or wink one eye. Mm -hmm. And he used that to blink out letter by letter, sentence by sentence, an entire book. Um, and I just, all these stories are things that have motivated me. And I was always really researching and kind of empathizing with people that were sort of trapped. And then, ironically, I became the person that was trapped, and so then I ended up making a piece about myself. But um, uh, yeah, I've always wanted to be in the festival, but um, I just needed the right piece. Yeah. And so life gave me the right <laughs> experience, I suppose, to make it. Did you get any um, decent audience input <coughs> when you, did you watch your own film in the festival? First yeah, time? yeah, that was actually uh, maybe the first time I watched it in the United States in a festival with an audience. Mm -hmm. So that was fun. Because it was also local, so a lot of friends were there. And um, uh, yeah, I think people get yeah. certain parts of it. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't include any of this sort of behind the scenes information before the film starts. And I've been told by some people that they would like um, like some text yeah. before it. So I'm I'm still I'm Thinking that I may add, I kind of liked bit. not knowing coming. Like yeah. I liked hearing it from you after what after I was able to see it because I kind of made my own story beforehand. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean it's not definitely not your typical narrative, but it does have a kind of arc to it. Yeah, it totally does. And it's does. not that I really escape being um, kind of confined, but uh, I don't know I, the arc to me when I was making. I was like, okay, I've gone underwater. I've been trapped. Like people are walking on top of me, I've got to get out of here, you know. And so that's why everything is going down, 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 down. And then the end of the movie, you're sort of coming back up for breath. And so that was kind of my way of pointing in a more positive direction. But still, I'm still standing on an iceberg, so it's still to be continued, maybe. <laughs> well, on that note, yeah. we're out of time. So okay. thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. To watch this and other CTN series online, visit a2gov.org slash CTN. Until next time, I'm Dana Denhoff.